the back door had a hard-coded C2 domain pointing to a listener on Terrell's machine. All I have to do is hack the registrar and change the name server configs. Once I hijack the domain, I can shut down their access before the Dark Army notices. Elliot. I'm almost done. I shut the back door. I just have to uninstall. <laughs> From guys in mop tops to guys in ski masks, I really don't know how they do it, but the British have kept a tight grip on the music industry for decades. And it isn't just the artists, there's a whole slew of musical genres originating from Britain, and of course Brits have also left significant marks on the music gear industry too. Next to big players like Marshall and Vox, Britain seems to have always had a number of small and tiny synth manufacturers, often innovating in the field of affordable gear. I've already featured quite a few of those British cottage industry synths on this channel, and today's synth seems to be right down this alley too. As the Evolution Synthesis EVS1 is another unique affordable synth, like the DB9, the Dark Star or even the original base station, it was created when Novation itself was still a tiny company. While googling for Evolution Synthesis brings up all sorts of articles on evolution and genetics, again just like with the creators of the Dark Star or the DB9, not much can be found out about Evolution Synthesis, the company behind the EVS1, which also seems to have been its only product. This is especially sad, as the EVS1 isn't just the budget FM expander people take it for at first sight, but actually quite a fascinating creation for a number of reasons. First, there is the way, or one should better say ways, sounds are created inside the EVS1. The closest modern equivalent to what the EVS-1 does in today's world are Arturius Microfreak or the Cork NTS-1, as both are algorithm-driven digital synthesizers. Sadly, of course, the EVS-1 doesn't offer quite a variety of its modern-day successors, but the Evolution Synthesis nevertheless managed to squeeze a relatively wide variety of different algorithms out of most certainly very humble early 90s technology. There are a number of FM algorithms present, as well as something that is said to resemble Casio's face distortion synthesis. Some very basic attempts at additive synthesis, plus a number of single cycle waveforms added into the mix and the list doesn't even end here yet. There are algorithms for wave shaping, width modulation and feedback or one should better say ring modulation and a whole set of algorithms that themselves mix multiple algorithm outputs into each other. All in all, it's surprisingly deep, or at least it looks so on paper. The next standout feature has since become its biggest showstopper, in that the first 20 presets can be modified and saved with an Atari ST or Windows 95 editor. I guess it was pretty freaking neat to have a graphical editor and librarian software bundled with your synth in 1990, but without access to these tools, DVS1 becomes pretty impossible to program. There seem to be some attempts to create editors for more modern OS's, but I took up the challenge and managed to get the OG editors up and running. And then, thirdly, of course, there is the fact that the EVS1 is also 16 voice 8 part multi timbre and an evolution synthesis still weren't done squeezing its budget synth full of even more features, and so they went ahead and even added some PCM sample drum sounds. So, why didn't this thing become a widespread success? Why is it frowned upon and disregarded by most? Well, it's probably down to a number of reasons, the biggest being that it was a bit too ambitious for its own good, and when the Ataris, capable of running the editor, went out of fashion, it ended up as yet another FM expander and a quite boring one at that too. There are countless reports on the net of people picking these up for mere pennies in the 2000s. To really appreciate what the EVS1 is, you have to take a look under that unsuspecting hood, something that is of course pretty difficult and you seem to need an early 90s home computer to do so. There actually is, as I've already mentioned before, a Windows editor too, designed for Windows 95. And there are even more recent ways to interact with the EVS one. But I will leave that for later, as it really is time to listen to some of the sounds now. Starting out with those wonderfully lo-fi drum sounds, here's a taste of the EVS built-in drums for y'all.
Before we listen to some of those preset sounds, let's have a look at the unit itself. The front literally features a very edgy design and wouldn't look out of place in an 80s sci-fi flick. On the very left there's a chunky power button, followed by a number of buttons and a very minimalistic array of LEDs. The arrow keys let you pick the parameter group, a red LED indicates the active group. Simplistic, yet elegant design. On the right there are more controls, as well as a very basic 3-digit display. With a display this limited of course, you might want to grab the manual every now and then to figure out what some of those cryptic characters displayed actually mean. To the very right, you'll find the main volume pot and the full-size headphone socket. Around the back, there really isn't much to see. There's a pair of quarter-inch outputs, you can set patches to hard left and right to turn these into single outs, the MIDI trio and the socket for the power supply. You'll need a 9V outside negative plug power supply to power the EVS1. And I found that the first universal power adapter I tried created some unwanted hissing noise. So you might want to find an old fashioned transformer power supply to use with this synth. So much for the controls and connectors. Let's listen to some of those presets I've picked. Here they come.
before we go on, let's have a look at the editing situation now. As mentioned earlier, DVS1 was intentionally created to be fully edited on a computer only. And back in the day, given its popularity among music producers, the Atari ST platform was a reasonable choice. I've managed to find a copy of the original Atari editor online and using the Atari emulator. I was even able to edit my unit through the emulator. This works just fine on Linux and I will definitely create a little video guide on how to set things up as my next video. Another way of editing DVS1 is the Windows editor that was written for Windows 95 but, with some command line magic, can also be set up to run on Windows 10. Once again I'll explain how to set it up in an upcoming video. One further and potentially the most future-proof possibility to edit the EVS1 is using universal MIDI editor software like MIDIQuest. As all the communication between the EVS and the computer is done via SysX, it's possible to create a custom editor in software, and that is what MIDIQuest seems to have done. So you can edit your early 90s synth from your early 2020s iPad. Whatever editor you use, this way you can unlock the EVS full potential and mess around with the freakier algorithms. Here are some examples of custom patches provided by deepsonic.ch. Most of these patches utilize the mod wheel for some real-time tweaking fun. As the EVS1 has 16 voices and is 8 part multitimbral and even has some drum sounds, let's hear it for a full demo song created using a single EVS1. For some strange reason, it accidentally shaped up to become our first ever cover version on this channel. It's incredibly silly, but I'm somehow really fond of it, so here we go.
And here we are once again at the end of the video. As I hope I was able to show you today, the nondescript looking EVS1 is actually a lot more than a boring early 90s FM preset expander. Sure, you'll have to put some work into it to get to the freakier stuff. If you, like me, don't mind going that extra mile though, the EVS1 might surprise you with some interesting sounds. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope to see you soon with another synth.